Dr. Charlotte Bañez with the Department of Pediatrics of Davao Medical School Foundation. And for this day, we will be talking about the next stage of childhood, which is infancy. Before we proceed with the rest of the lecture, I will give you a few minutes to access this Google form. So this will serve as your answer key for the quiz that we will have during this lecture. The secretary also sent this link to your class te telegram so you can access the Google form through your class telegram. So you have to watch out for this question mark icon uh, which will mean that there is a question posted in the slide. So um, questions will be posted all throughout the lecture. The Google form will serve as your answer key, which should be submitted within the class period. You have to remember that late submissions will not be accepted. So your the Google form should look like this the one posted on the screen, and I'll give you a few seconds to finish um, filling up the your batch section, your roll number, and your name. So let's begin. For this lecture, I will introduce you the second stage of childhood, and we will also present the milestones that we will see during this stage. And lastly, we will promote awareness regarding the red flags that we can see during infancy. So, in infancy is the stage in childhood between 1 month to 12 months old. In the first lecture you had, um, which talked about um, the newborn period or uh, the neonatal period, that talked about um, babies from birth until 28 days. So after that is considered infancy. So during this stage, babies are dependent on their caregivers, especially to their moms because babies cannot verbalize. And so, during a clinic checkup or a hospital visit, you know, when you do your history taking, you must rely on the caregiver's version of the child's history. So, talking about the history of an infant, it shall contain, it should contain the following information. Of course, your patient's profiles, the presenting complaint or the chief complaint, and then the history of present illness. Now, what makes a pediatric history different from an adult history is that you should also ask for the following information. The birth history of the patient, the feeding history, immunization history, developmental history, of course, your past medical history, personal social history, and family history, with the last three are also um, part you know, of an, uh, the usual um, history, uh, patient history. So during this stage, you know, the stage of infancy, you will have a lot to ask with regards the birth history, feeding history, immunization, and developmental history. Physical examination of an infant should is also not considered difficult, but you should see it as an art. No? So, um, when doing physical examination of an infant, your assessment is not necessarily in the head-to-toe manner, like what you do in an adult. No? So, what does that mean? When the patient is quiet, you can auscultate the heart, the lungs, and the abdomen first. You can assess the heart and the respiratory rates before you're doing your temperature and then you do palpation and percussion of the same areas and perform traumatic procedures last no? like um, uh, examining the ear using an otoscope or examination examining the throat using a tongue depressor those are performed um, last no? during your examination you can also elicit re reflexes as body part as the body part is examined, and then you also elicit more reflex, 
blast because this will trigger your baby to cry. You also encourage the caretaker to hold the infant during an exam. And you can do distraction using a soft voice. You can offer a pacifier, a music, or a toy. The development of an infant requires assessment of these four aspects. You have your physical development, your social and emotional development, intellectual development, and language development. So all throughout the lecture, we will be talking about the development of, of, of infants um, according to these four aspects. So we will, so we will start with the physical development. Infancy is a period when there is rapid physical growth. So what are the general growth changes expected during pregnancy? So examples would be for the weight. You, the child's weight doubles by four to six months and triples by one year old. So it means that when a child born um, weighing three kilograms, the expected weight at four to six months will be six kilos and the expected weight at one year old should be nine kilograms for length it increases by 50 percent at one year old so if the birth length of the baby is 50 cm it will be expected to be at 75 cms at one year old the head circumference increases also by 10 centimeters at one year old so at this stage at one year old the baby's head circumference if the baseline head circumference is let's say um 32 centimeters then the head circumference at one year old must be at 42 centimeters the head size at birth is one third of the entire body at two years old it becomes one fourth of the entire body and during adulthood, uh, it, incre uh, it decreases, the proportion decreases to one-eighth of the entire body. And so which means that the, the younger the patient is or the younger the child is, the higher is the proportion of the head compared to the body. In terms of brain growth at birth, the baby weighs, the, the brain weighs 25% of an adult brain and at the end of two years old it already becomes 80% of the adult brain and at puberty um, the brain size is already the adult size of the brain no? so it means that during birth between birth to two years old there is a rapid brain growth and uh, therefore um, infancy is an important um, stage no, for brain development. So how do we approximate weight gain per month? This table is found in, in, in your book Nelson's and it will show you how the weight, the length, and the head circumference increases per month no, during the first uh, year of life um, and it also shows the recommended daily allowance for that child per stage so during the first week of life the weight decreases by 10 percent below the birth weight now, so this is called the physiologic weight loss so meaning when a baby is born at three kilograms during the first week of life you don't expect them to increase their weight in fact, you will expect them to lose 10% of their birth weight. And then during the second week of life, the infant will start to regain or exceed their birth weight and then grow at approximately three, 30 grams per day during the first month. Okay, so after the physiologic weight loss of 10% um, below the weight, birth weight, the weight of the baby, the baby should be gaining at least 10 to 15 grams per day until it regains or exceeds its birth weight at the second week of life. And after that, it will increase by 30 grams per day during the first month. And then on the third and fourth month, the rate growth 
slows down to approximately 20 grams per day so that by four months old the baby's weight should double the birth weight so if you can see in the first three months of life the weight gain uh, the growth is faster no, as compared to the latter um, periods and so in this uh, in this uh, period the baby will require um, higher calories now if you can see in the table the baby requires 115 calories per kilo per day in the first three months as compared to the later months which only requires 100 to 110 calories per kilogram per day so in terms of physical development these are the things that we can observe in an infant so an infant who is uh, less than two months old you will see that the arms are held to the sides the limb movements consist largely of uncontrolled writhing with purposeless opening and closing of the hands their smiling occurs involuntarily so they, they don't really smile at you because they find you attractive or they find you cute no, their smiles are involuntar involuntary. The eye gaze, head turning, and sucking are under better control as compared to newborns. And their sleep and wakefulness are evenly distributed throughout the 24-hour period. When they grow to 2 to 6 months old, there will be uh, a disappearance of a an important reflex no, called your asymmetric tonic neck reflex and the disappearance of this reflex is very important because it allows the infant to examine objects in the midline and manipulate them with both hands so if, as you can see um in this um in this picture the picture on the upper right it will show a baby holding an object and manipulating them with both hands okay there's also waning of the early grasp reflex which allows the infant both which the in the allows the infant to hold objects you know, with both hands and to let them go voluntarily a novel object may elicit purposeful Although inefficient reaching, there is also increasing control of troncal flexion, which makes intentional rolling possible. An infant can also hold their head steady while sitting, and therefore they can gaze across things. Maturation of the visual system also allows them greater depth perception, and in this period, infants also achieve stable state regulation and regular sleep wake cycles so this uh, particular period also prepares the baby for feeding at 6 to 12 months um, these are the abilities that an infant can can do no? so they can sit unsupported at se 6 to 7 months they can pivot while sitting at around 9 to 10 months. There is emergence of the thumb finger grasp at 8 to 9 months. And there is a knee pincer grasp at 12 months. So these uh, milestones provides them increasing opportunities to explore, manipulate several objects. They also begin crawling and pull to stand at around 8 months, which is followed by cruising. Now cruising means that they can hold on to a for example a wall or the side of the crib and then they they walk around uh, the sides of of the crib they are also a, they are also able to walk at one year old so these gross motor skills expand the infant's exploratory range and create new physical dangers as well as opportunities for learning and therefore when you have a an infant um, in the clinic no, for a, let's say, a well checkup visit or an immunization, this is also an opportunity 
for the doctor and the parents to discuss about the dangers that um that that the the uh, how to protect the the infant from the dangers that are expected no when they when they achieve this um gross motor skills okay so another important um event no in an infant is also tooth eruption and uh the first teeth that may erupt are the actually the central incisors no the lower uh the 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 central mandibular incisors which usually occurs um between 7 to 8 months and then it will be followed by the upper central incisors at uh 9 to 10 months so you just follow this um table no so that you will be guided on how to how to examine or how to check no which tooth should you examine in an infant so um usually there is a concern when the teeth when no teeth hasn't erupted at one year old Okay, so there are three um, anthropometric measurements that are important no, in assessing an infant. So anthropometrics is a very important uh, data with regards uh, examination of an infant. So we assess the weight, we assess the length, and we also assess the head circumference. So when assessing the weight, it must be determined using an accurate scale. No, so if the baby cannot sit or cannot stand on a weighing scale, you should be using an infantometer like the one um, illustrated in the topmost uh, picture. So when weighing, the baby should be naked, and ideally, repeated measures should be performed on the same equipment when when determining the patient's length this is measured ideally by two examiners so one will pos help position the child and the other will determine the measurement so when determining the length the child should be in a supine position or a measuring board for older children that can stand already what you measure is not the length but the height so when you measure the height the uh the child should be standing of course and it should be taken without shoes using a stadiometer the head circumference is also measured um, using a flexible tape that is run from the supraorbital supra ridge to the occiput in the path that leads to the largest possible measurement so um so you, you look at the picture below uh that's how we measure the head circumference so your tape should should touch the supraorbital ridge that, that's above the the eyebrows and the occiput no? and then what do we do with the measurements when we measure the weight length and height we don't just write the numbers on the chart no but it's more important that you you plot the measurements and you interpret the measurements if the measurements are appropriate for age so um, we plot them in these five standard gender specific charts no we have a separate chart for boys and a separate chart for girls no so boys you have your blue charts girls have pink charts no so we have um, charts for weight for age for length for age and then head circumference for age so these three charts are the standard charts when the measurements fall beyond the appropriate measurement for age then you have to plot the measurements you have to use different 
uh, another chart, no? So, we have your weight for height or length and your BMI for age for children over 2 years old. So, I will show you pictures on how these charts look like. This is the WHO chart for weight for age for girls. So you, as you can see, the chart is pink. And then you have um, the lines on the graph. No? You have a graph uh, that shows Z-score of 3, Z-score of 2, Z-score of 0, Z-score of negative 2, and a Z-score of negative 3. No? So usually, what is most ideal is when the child's measurement falling at or near z-score zero so this is the weight for age for girls and then and then this is the one for boys no weight for age length for age girls length for age boys Weight for length girls, weight for length boys, head circumference for age girls, head circumference for age boys. And then these two are the charts for BMI for age for both girls and boys. So we're already done with the physical development aspect. We will now look at the social and emotional development as well as language development of an infant. So during the first two months, the infant is dependent on the environment to meet his or her needs. And the constant availability of a trusted adult to meet the infant's urgent needs creates the condition for secure attachment. And during this period, Erickson's social stage, staging um, labeled the first two months to, to be trust versus mistrust. And um, it means that your, your child depends on a attachment and reciprocal maternity or maternal bonding crying or fuzziness occurs in response to stimuli that may be obvious like a soil diaper but are often obscure so sometimes you don't understand why why the, the baby cries no sometimes uh, well, most of the time it may be because of a soil diaper or maybe because the infant is hungry but oftentimes, they just want to be held, they just want to be carried, or they want a different room temperature, or, well, at times, um, they might be having colic, no? So, it's, it's usually um, common also during infancy. This is common in 20% of younger infants, uh, of infants younger than 2 months of age. And this is actually transient and a normal behavior activity in most infants. But also, they are often associated with parental concern and distress. Sometimes when you go on night duty no, in the emergency room, you will sometimes um, encounter parents bringing their babies or infants in the emergency room and like telling the doctor that they are they are concerned because the baby will not stop crying only to to see the baby in the ER already asleep so this may be this may be an example of the babies um in the stage no of uh, being fussy so this stage of development as we said earlier the baby is dependent on the reciprocal um, behavior of the caregiver so it will also um, affect the temper 
of the child as an adult. So if you compare a baby which is constantly held when they cry, you know, for example, when they're when they when they cry because they are hungry or when they have sore diaper or or when they are fuzzy, they are carried by their parents or being soothed. Um, they will grow up to be better tempered individuals as compared to babies who are left crying. No, so it is not um true that we should leave the baby crying when they when they are fuzzy to be um disciplined no so um it, it well many studies have shown that that when when babies cry they need to be soothed they need to be held no so um when you, when you encounter parents um in your clinics uh with with a child in this stage it's also important that you um, you you give them proper education on how to take care of their children at 2 to 6 months the babies interact with increasing sophistication and range the primary emotions of anger joy interest fear disgust and surprise appear in appropriate context as distinct facial expressions. So when they're happy, they will show it to their faces. When they are, when they are scared, they will, sh will they will, uh, it will be shown on their faces that they're scared. If they are mad, no, they will, they will show it. You you will see it in their faces that that they are mad. So during six to twelve months, there will there is the advent of object permanence, and this corresponds with qualitative changes in social and communicative development. Um, the infants will look back and forth between an approaching stranger and parent, and may cling or cry anxiously, demonstrating stranger anxiety. So stranger anxiety usually begins um, around ten months old. Separations often become more difficult because of this, and there's a new demand for autonomy during this stage. Oftentimes, there is poor weight gain during this stage, and this is often explained because there is usually a struggle between an infant's emerging independence and the parent's control of the feeding situation. Tantrums also occur as the drive for autonomy and mastery comes in conflict with parental controls and the infant's still limited abilities. So at seven months old, the infants adept at, are adept at nonverbal communication. They express a range of emotions and responds to vocal tone and facial expressions. At nine months old, the infants become aware that emotions can be shared between people. So they show their parents toys as a way of sharing their happy feelings. Between eight and ten months of age, babbling takes on a complexity with multisyllabic sounds like ba dama. Babies can discriminate between language and in infants in bilingual homes learn the characteristics and rules that govern two different languages so when, when you have a baby with uh, parents um, speaking different languages they can actually uh, discriminate no between the two languages so now let's go to intellectual development During the first two months, the infants can dis differentiate among patterns, colors, and consonants. And the picture on your left is an example of um, RBW patterns or objects, no? red, black, white objects. And these are the usually the colors or the patterns that uh, can stimulate the vision of of a baby less than two months old they can recognize facial expressions for example smiles at the as similar even if they occur or appear on different faces 
The infants also during this stage appear to seek stimuli actively as though satisfying an innate need to make sense of the world. Caretaking ability, uh, activities provide should provide visual, tactile, of olfactory, and auditory stimuli, which all of these should support the development of cognition. So as early as the first two months of life, you should be able to uh, or the caretaker should provide these stimuli, no? all visual, tactile, olfactory, and auditory to support the development of the patient's cognition or intellect. The infants habituate to the familiar, attending less to repeated stimuli, stimuli and increasing their attention to novel stimuli. So they become more uh, interested in their environment as they grow. At four months of age, the infants are described as, as hatching socially as they become more interested in a wider world. The infants at this stage also explore their own bodies, staring intently at their hands, vocalizing, blowing bubbles, and touching their ears, cheeks, and genitals. So if you have a patient um, at this stage, well, in my practice, I discourage the use of uh, mittens, no? Mittens that will cover their hands because at this stage, this stage is the stage the the period where the infant will explore their bo their 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 bodies and if they have mittens if they have covers no with their hands they cannot do this no so um yeah we i personally discourage the use of mittens during this stage they have a role in the emergence of a sense of self separate from the mother and this is the first stage of personality development Infants come to associate certain sensations through frequent repetitions. Repetitions. So we've mentioned object permanence earlier, and uh, this object permanence is also called constancy, and this is a major milestone that is achieved by nine months old. So Object permanence is the understanding that objects continue to exist even when they are not seen. So, if you compare a baby who is four to seven months of age, no, when you have a when they have a ball, yarn ball, in their hands and they drop it, they will look down for the yarn ball that has been dropped, but quickly give up if it if they cannot anymore see the ball but with object permanence or with constancy the infant will persist in searching because they know that even if they are not seeing the if if they don't see the the object they'd understand that it is still there they will find objects hidden under a cloth or behind the examiner's back so during this stage uh, an, an interesting game is peekaboo. No, so this the peekaboo is actually um, uh, uh, an exercise of intellectual development for nine months old and above. No, so when you see, play peekaboo with a baby who is four months, that's not that's not gonna work. That's not that is not that that will not make them um, that will not. It's not enjoyable for them, no. So peekaboo is actually a game for nine months old and above. So this brings a limited pleasure as the child magically brings back the other player. Events seem to occur as a result of the child's own activities. So now we will review the different developmental milestone in the first year of life. And this is a lot, no. You can see this is a... Uh, this is actually a joyful um, period during uh, for par for most parents because this is the time when you will see several milestones in terms of gross motor skills, fine motor skills, language, and even social skills. So we start with gross motor skills. No, at two months old, the baby can hold the head steady while sitting. At three months old, they can pull to sit, 
with no head lag and bring hands together in the midline. At four months, there will be disappearance of the asymmetric tonic neck reflex. At six months, they can sit without support and roll back to their stomach. At 12 months, they can usually walk alone. So fine motor skills, when you say fine motor skills, these are the movements that use the hands and the fingers. No? So at three months old, the baby can grasp a rattle. At four months, they can reach for objects. And this is the time where the palmer grasp is, has disappeared. At five months, they can transfer an object from hand to hand. At eight months, they will have a thumb fin. Uh, they will begin to have the thumb finger grasp. And at 12 months or at one year old, they can already turn pages of the book. In terms of communication and language, so um, after one month, they can smile in response to face or voice. At six months, they will have monosyllabic bubbles. At seven months, they inhibit to know or follow one step command with the gesture. At 10 months, um, they can follow one step command without gesture. You can say mama or dada and points to object. And at 12 months, they can speak the first real word. In terms of cognitive skills, so at 2 months, they can stare momentarily at the spot where the object disappeared. But since they don't have um, object permanence yet, they will lose interest after a while no, of not seeing the object. At four months, they can stand at their own hands. At eight months, they can bang two cubes and uncover toys after seeing it hidden. So at eight months, there is emergence. So at this stage, no, eight to nine months, there is emergence of object permanence. Then at 12 months, they begin to have egocentric symbolic play like pretending to drink from a cup. Another important um, event no, in an infant is the start of feeding. No? So from pure milk feeding or um, breastfeeding, your, the baby will also transition to eating solid. So when you say complementary feeding, this is the introduction of any solid or liquid other than the breast milk or infant formula. No? So the... The developmental milestones, most especially the gross motor skills that we have discussed earlier, actually prepares the infant for complementary feeding. So, for example, when they are able to sit without support, without head lag, uh, sit without head lag, and their ability to, to bring their hands in the midline and the disappearance of the asymmetric tonic neck reflex these are the milestones that prepare the baby for complementary feeding so actually the who recommends that complementary feeding should start at six months but when you look at um the the other recommendations if you think the baby is ready for example the baby can sit um can sit without support the baby can hold his the his or her head for a long time, no meaning there's no head lag. The, you can see the baby's interest for meals, no, for example, they try to grab the food from an adult, or uh, the baby continues to be hungry in between milk feeding. Um well, the, these are the indications that the baby might be ready for complementary feeding even if the baby is younger than six months old. So it's important that you also discuss this with, with parents, no, watching out for milestones that um, indicate readiness for complementary feeding. So we've seen a lot of uh, milestones uh, in the period of infancy. 
and because of this you should also be um, alert on the possible red flags um, that when they are seen a baby should be referred to a specialist no specifically to a developmental pediatrician so when you see red flags during a particular um, period in the infant then uh, you should immediately refer them for further assessment. So these are the red flags that are listed in the Preventive Pediatric Healthcare Handbook of the Philippine Pediatric Society. So for example, a baby at four months lacks steady head control while sitting. No? So when you, we, when you uh, allow them to sit, and there will there is still head lag that is a red flag at nine months if they are not able to sit and at 18 months if they are not able to walk independently these are red flags that may indicate that the baby might have the most common cerebral palsy and it should uh, the, the baby should be referred to a neurologist uh, if you see these things for social and emotional um, development, so these are the red flags, no? If at six months, if the baby lacks smile or other joyful expression, if there is lack of reciprocal vocalizations or smiles or other facial expression, and if at 12 months, if there is failure to respond to name and code, the absence of babbling, the lack of reciprocal gestures no so these are the um red flags that should uh warrant immediate referral at any age if for example there is a loss of previously acquired babbling speech or social skills that will also um that will also require uh referral to a specialist okay um, pointing or showing um, gestures are is also an important uh, milestone no for 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 children but this usually occurs at well 12 to 15 months so at 15 months if they do not point no to for example what they want that is considered a red flag for receptive language Okay. Receptive language is um, how a baby understands the instructions, for example, or, to, or what you're tell what you an adult is telling them. Okay, and usually receptive language um, comes first before expressive language. Ex expressive language is the 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 where the baby will uh, produce sound in order to to utter words or to utter uh, babbling for example so at for receptive language for two months if they do not alert to or quiet to sound at six months if they do not turn to the source of the voice at 10 months if they do not respond to their own names and if at 12 months they do not follow verbal routines or games so well, the most important um, uh, assessment here is the assessment of healing. No? So, for example, at two months, if they do not alert or quiet to sound, then maybe these, ba they, these babies should be referred for, for, for hearing tests. No? Um, hearing should come first before a baby will be able to speak. So, it's, it should it is important that we should establish whether a baby can hear or not. So these are the red flags for expressive language. At 6 months, if they do not coo. At 10 months, if they do not babble. And at 12 months, if there is absence of non-verbal purposeful messages like showing of objects. And at 14 months, as I said earlier, the absence of pointing, that is a red flag. So the importance of knowing the milestones, the different milestones as well as these red flags is that we will be able to identify the 
children who needs um, early intervention, uh, who are the babies with developmental delays, no, so that we can refer them to to um, the, the proper specialist and for them to be able to receive early intervention so that they will grow up to be uh, to be individuals with with purpose individuals who can who can still have jobs and individuals who can be uh, who can be useful as adults okay um, the learning about the milestones will not only enable us to identify those with developmental delays but will also help us identify who are those with talents who are those who are geniuses no? because we might be able to miss these um, children who have special qualities so that's the reason why we we uh, we have to learn about these developmental milestones no? During infancy is also an important stage wherein we can intervene with regards problems in the eyes. So during 6 to 12 months, it's important that we, that we assess visual response, know whether the child can fix or follow. We inspect the conjunctiva, where it, where, whether it is white and lustrous or not and whether the cornea is clear so for example for visual response if you see blanks that the infant has black stare then you should refer them to the ophthalmologist if you see a dry conjunctiva or uh, opacities in the cornea then it's also an indication for an ophthalmologic referral in terms of ocular motility uh, there should be equal or central corneal ref reflexes. No? So you do the Hirschberg test and the eyes should be steady and aligned. So if you see non-central or unequal corneal reflexes and if you see jiggly eyes or misaligned lines, then that's also an indication for an ophthalmologic referral. And you, you should also do the Bruckner test. So you should, do, you should um, use an ophthalmoscope with this. And you should be able to see a red-orange reflex. So if you see an absent or dull or asymmetric red-orange reflex, or if you see leukoria, then this is also an indication for referral to an ophthalmologist. So that's the end of our lecture for, for today. I will be entertaining questions. You can um, type them in the class chat box so that I can answer them. If you have queries or if you have, uh, if you have um, concerns with regards the the lecture, all of the data that are that are included in the lecture can also be read in Nelson's. And please don't forget to submit your. Um, Google Forms, the answer sheets to your quizzes that we just had. Good day, everyone.